So Jesus had 12 disciples, and when the first church was planted, they were now known as apostles, and their primary job was to teach and embody as much of Jesus to the people around them as possible. Now, however, in Acts chapter 6, as the church was growing, which is a good thing, they were now tasked with more things, so much more than they could handle. So they appointed seven men called deacons to help them out. These men were known as Hellenistic Jews because they spent most of their lives outside of Israel. They identified as Jewish, but they just didn't live in Israel. Now, last week we talked about Stephen, who seemed to be the leader of these seven deacons. And because of that, they had a very unique perspective. So Stephen one day said, hey, look, I've noticed that this temple system creates an unjust system where it only benefits the elite religious group of Israel. And everyone else, like foreigners, widows, sinners, orphans, they always end up getting the shoulder into the stick. And when Stephen said that, he was actually seeing it to the faces of the elites of Israel and as a result, he was murdered. So today we're gonna to be talking about another deacon. His name is Philip. He traveled into one of the most avoided areas of Israel, a land called Samaria. that day, persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. So when Stephen was killed for his attempt at bringing heaven on earth, the church dispersed into the surrounding areas, and here we meet our friend, Philip. It's recorded for us that Philip went to a place called Samaria, and Samaria was one of the most taboo locations for the Jews. So why is that? What is the big deal with Samaria? If you were to split Israel into general territories, there was the region of Galilee to the north. This was a place where a lot of business was conducted because a lot of food like fish was obtained there. There's Judea to the south. This is where the religious epicenter of Israel was. As you can see, Jerusalem is located in that region. And in the middle is a small plot of land called Samaria. I mean, I'm pretty sure they would rather be where the food is plentiful, like in Galilee or close to God's temple in the south in Judea. But since they weren't wanted in either regions, they ended up living in the middle where there's a lot of hills and not much else. You see, around 597 BC, about 600 years prior to the story in Acts, the Babylonians intruded Israel and took thousands of prisoners with them. And they didn't just capture random people. They took the strongest and smartest Jews because they knew that they would be an asset to their own empire. And the people who remained in Israel, well, they were lost and they had no guidance on how to live out their Jewish culture. So years later, when the exiled Jews eventually returned to Israel, they saw a bunch of compromising Jews and they eventually ended up being isolated from the true Jews. Over time, the Samaritans created their own separate civilization in the middle with their own version of the temple and that further created a big wedge between them. So if you were a true Jew in the first century, you would do all you can to avoid walking through Samaria. I mean, we all know that the quickest route between two points is a straight line, right? Well, the Jewish community walked around Samaria to get from Galilee to Judea. And yes, this added extra days to their trips and became quite expensive, but to them, it was worth it. It was better than walking through Samaria. Now, what I just described to you is an overgeneralization of the history of Samaria, but I'm just trying to illustrate this one simple yet disturbing point, which is that Samaria was avoided by the Jews at all costs. All right, back to the seven deacons. They were Hellenistic Jews, which means that they knew a thing or two about being treated as outsiders. So when these Hellenistic Jewish men became Jesus followers, they found the inclusive nature of the church as a very attractive feature. I mean, regardless of their race, history, nationality, if they wanted to be a part of the family of God, they were in. So when eventually they were chosen to become deacons of the church, they said, hey, you know, if Jesus is all about bringing heaven on earth, and if these Jews have kept their distance from the Samaritans for all these years, maybe it's time we repair that broken relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. So Philip, he decided to go to Samaria to build this bridge between the church and this huge community of outcasts. So he basically said, let's boldly go to where Jews have avoided for centuries. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. 
So there was great joy in that city. So a few years ago, Jesus walked the earth and he taught and healed people wherever he went. Now Philip is doing the exact same thing in Samaria. So this is good stuff. But then he comes across an interesting person, Simon. In some church literature, he is called Simon Magus because Magus means magic. In some of your Bibles, he's probably called Simon the Sorcerer. Now, apparently for some time before Philip arrived in Samaria, Simon gained a cult following because he was the man who performed many miracles. It seems that his followers refer to him by his nickname, the Great Power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. This guy was like a rock star. I mean, remember, the Samaritans were not allowed in Judea where the temple was, where people were worshiping God. And apparently, magic was the only thing that they had that reminded them of God. But when Philip came and started doing better and greater miracles, miracles that transformed people from the inside out, the crowd started to sway more and more towards Philip. Philip. But when they believed Philip and he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So not only was Philip performing miracles, he also had a message attached to it. It was a message about worth and how everyone belonged to one another. It was a message about love and about God who laid his life down for these outcasts. So at this point in the story, Simon Magus was feeling a bit left out. So he hopped on the Jesus train just like everyone else. I mean, according to the text, it says that he even got baptized and then he began hanging out with Philip so he can witness more miracles. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. It doesn't tell us why the apostles who were extremely busy with their work had time to make the trek out to Samaria. The explanation for the apostles cameo here is that other members of the church in Jerusalem were skeptical about the Samaritan conversion. I mean, keep in mind that these Christians back in Jerusalem, they were Jews. And now they had Samaritan brothers and sisters. I mean, imagine your entire life. You heard about these compromised Jews living to the region just north of you. And now they're considered to be a part of your spiritual family. Peter and John traveled to Samaria to confirm the conversions. Oh, and by the way, in the Catholic church, there's a ritual called confirmation. This verse is where that practice came from. So when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. All right, get this. Peter, a Hebraic Jew who became a Jesus follower, is now placing his hands on top of a Samaritan who is now a Jesus follower. What he's doing in essence is welcoming them into the family of God. He is breaking down barriers. What was once separated is now coming together. Now, while this isn't mentioned in this part of the text, it's implied that as soon as the apostles prayed over the Samaritan Jesus followers, something happened outwardly and it caught the attention of Simon Magus. Apparently the people they prayed over began to perform miracles. Okay, so now Peter and John have finished their duty. Now they're ready to go home. But right at that moment, Peter gets pulled aside by a newly baptized Simon Magus. Now, before we read on and find out what Simon said to Peter, let's put it into context what's happened so far. Simon was a magician. He was a sorcerer. He built up his fame, it says that he had many followers, and his reputation, it says that he was called the great power of God and was making a living through his supernatural abilities. But as soon as Philip came into his territory, he demonstrated greater power than Simon, so Simon started losing his followers. And then to make things worse for him, Peter and John shows up and prays for his ex-followers, and now they are experiencing miracles. So whatever made Simon unique and relevant is no longer unique and relevant. So what do you think he did next? Well, what about becoming like Peter and John, someone who can impart miracles on other people? When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. All right, so the issue with Simon is that his identity is totally wrapped up in supernatural events. I mean, he had a huge following because people were drawn to his supernatural acts. Which brings me to an interesting thought. Simon decided to follow Jesus because of the miracles he saw Philip perform. See, Simon is attracted to supernatural phenomenons, but not to God. You see, this is very interesting because in the Bible, supernatural works is not a sign that is unique to God. You see, today we think if there's a miracle, that must have been God. You can't look at someone performing miracles and assume that that person is mature in faith. In today's Christianity, we assume a person is mature in their faith when they perform a miracle. 
or we think that if the church is big, then the pastor must be spiritually mature. Or if a person has memorized a lot of verses or a person behaves a certain way, that that person might be further along in their faith journey than you. Or take me for example, just because I preach a few good sermons doesn't mean that I'm a mature Christian. It just means that I'm a good speaker. Or if a person sings a beautiful worship song and it just moves your heart, it doesn't mean that that person is mature in their walk with Jesus. It just means that they're good at singing. Oh, the reverse is also true. Just because someone can't memorize one single Bible verse or can't preach a good sermon or doesn't know the lyrics to the fourth verse of Amazing Grace doesn't mean that they're immature in their faith. And according to this story and many other stories in the Bible, we'll see that there's destruction for communities that associate talent with maturity. I mean, later in the Bible, it teaches us that the best way to measure somebody's spiritual maturity is through the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, patience, all those things and not so much in the fruit of their talents. Oh, and another point, although we see Philip performing miracles in this passage, in the bigger picture, he wasn't really known for his miracles. He was known as someone who ventured out into Samaria, a neighborhood that everyone avoided. He was known as somebody who desperately wanted to bring heaven on earth by tearing down the separation between these two regions. Yes, he was a conduit for God's miracle, but miracles, well, they weren't his defining feature. He wasn't yearning for miracles. He desired restoration, and as a result, God decided to heal people through him. And Simon Magus, he was the exact opposite of Philip. He was attracted to miracles and some were fooled into following him because they were blown away by his spiritual acts. I mean, if you compare him to the apostles, they were attracted to God's works and restoration, heaven on earth, which included occasional miracles. Philip, he wanted restoration. Philip trekked into the unknown lands, risking his own life, just like Stephen did to share the love of God to the people that have not known that love. Simon was only thinking of his own gain, his following, and his reputation. New Testament scholar Willie J. Jennings states this, There are people the world over who live and breathe and envision Christian faith only in its utility and only through exchange. Though they stand near its intimate space, they are not in it. In other words, Simon saw God as a commodity to be purchased and traded, a mere tool wielded by the hands of those skilled in, in spiritual practices. He wanted power, but not God. And as you may have expected, his attempt to buy God's spirit was met with a firm rebuke by Peter. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Here, Peter is exposing the distance that Simon has from God, even while he's standing in the midst of the divine presence, even as the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Now remember, just a few verses ago, Simon just got baptized, which was a symbol of his surrender to God. But as evidenced by this question, this, this request, he actually desires the ability to control God. So Peter continues his rebuke. Simon, I can still see that you're stuck in the bitter poison and chains of unrighteousness. In other words, Peter is saying, Simon, you and your money, it's poison to us. And so God's gonna destroy you. So Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So we don't know what came of Simon Magus, but all it says is the apostles traveled throughout Samaria, building more bridges with them. So what is the takeaway from this account? Why did Luke record this story for us? Well, I think it's helpful to understand the theme of the entire book of Acts, to understand what the purpose of this passage is really about. You see, in the beginning of the book, God was working within a small community of Jewish men. And then God started working with a greater group of people. So these people said, hey, we need to embrace this group too, because it seems that God loves them too. And then God shows that he loves an even greater community. And so the apostles are like, well, we need to include them in our family also. And throughout the rest of the book of Acts, we discover that God loves the entire world. It's as if the church is watching God to see how big his embrace is. Now, remember in the Jewish culture, they believe that they were solely the people that God loved. And now in the book of Acts, they're discovering, oh, God loves them too. God loves these people also, those outcasts God loves. Philip goes to an off limits community and God begins to show that he loves the Samaritans too. So the apostles join in. God is a free spirit. He goes wherever he wants and the church's role is to join in on what God is doing wherever he is. But then they encounter Simon Magus who thinks that he can control God. When the church's mission is to let God do whatever he wants and we will join in on what you're doing and they come across somebody who says, I wanna be able to control God's power. 
of course that person is going to be labeled as venomous. This point is best summarized by New Testament scholar N.T. Wright. Any attempt to bring the spirit under human control is a nonsense and to be rejected outright. The spirit is the spirit of the sovereign God who blows where he wants and how he wants. Neither Peter nor John nor Philip nor any human being then, since or now, can do other than be open to what the spirit wants, ready to be blown along by the rushing mighty wind. So church, may we become active participants of God's great work of building bridges with one another. And may we not blindly chase after miracles, but fervently chase after God and His kingdom. And may we experience heaven together. God bless.